Well, the state Supreme Court has ruled and collective bargaining for most public employees is gone. Now the budget process continues. UW political scientist Charles Franklin returns with his take on the current goings on at the Capitol. Good to see you again. It's been almost 48 hours. <laughs> yes, well, we've had a very busy week, haven't we? Yes. Let's back up to yesterday, the Supreme Court decision. Does this surprise you at all? I don't think it was hugely surprising. The court divided four to three, the usual conservative to liberal split. Um, you know, I thought the main thing was that the majority uh, clearly said that the legislature has lots of prerogatives in how it conducts its business, and the court shouldn't meddle in that. And secondly, the challenges should come after the law is implemented rather than by stopping it being signed or, or uh, published. And so in that, I think... Uh, uh, Governor Walker and the Republicans got pretty much everything they wanted, including a seemingly pretty high barrier to challenging legislative procedures, including the open meetings law that was the core of this case. So is this the end of the story or isn't it? Oh, it's never the end of the story, <laughs> right? I think this is the end of Judge Sumi's decision and the case that came out of that. Um, it also, I think, sends a strong signal that further challenges based on open meetings are unlikely to succeed if and when they make it to the state Supreme Court. But we saw a filing today by a number of unions in federal court to challenge the constitutionality of the changes in the labor laws in the state. And I think that may be the next venue that we see this played out in. Well, some critics are saying that the Supreme Court decision yesterday essentially puts the legislature above the law. Uh, I think the critics certainly see it that way. Uh, from the perspective of the four justices in the majority, their point is the separation of powers is quite strong, and it means the legislature is the ultimate arbiter of its rules. I think the other side of this would be that the way the case approached the issue of open meetings and how it was applied got mixed up with the question of whether it was before or after the law was published. So I think it's conceivable you could see an approach to that, but I really think we'll see uh, more suits both at the state and the federal level, but they'll probably attack the law in different ways rather than try to repeat what just lost in the Supreme Court is the argument. Did we learn anything about the internal workings of the court by this I, decision? I think we saw that the split remained strong. The, the three dissenting justices are often in the minority and their attack on the majority opinion is quite strongly worded. Um, but I think the division there is pretty stable. I, I think the one thing we've seen that's maybe as a matter of public policy the most disturbing is that Republicans see Judge Sumi's decisions as entirely politically motivated. And people on the Democratic and Union side see the four justices in the majority as entirely politically motivated. And as long as both sides are only seeing political motivation rather than a plausible reading of the law in either of these two sides, we're essentially saying we have no confidence in the umpires. And, you know, shouting kill the umpires is a long and cherished tradition in American uh, <laughs> politics as well as sports. But it's perhaps a little disturbing about what it says about where the judiciary stands as an independent arbiter. So probably not heard the end of this situation. Yet. Not in this. No. All, right. All right, Charles. Thank you. Thank Alex, you, Charles, we'll as always. We'll see you tomorrow. We'll see you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs>